Hello, and welcome to the seventh installment of Spartan Step Up. The CWRU community responds to COVID-19. This web series is coordinated by the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University. I'm Carol Musel, Dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. Our broadcast today will focus on how COVID-19 is affecting older adults. We'll examine how we can better protect them through the pandemic and beyond. We have with us today one alumna from the School of Nursing and one current Doctor of Nursing Practice student. First, we have Cheryl Bass, the owner and manager of Older Wiser Life Services, LLC. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me. We're pleased that you're here. And we have Ann M. Ponert, Director of Clinical Quality at CVS Minute Clinic. Welcome, Ann. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a few questions for Cheryl and Ann before we go to our submitted questions. If you have questions you would like to submit, you may do so by using the chat feature on the live stream, or if you're watching us on Facebook Live, please ask your questions in the comments section. Before we delve into COVID-19, I would like to first ask Anne to talk more about her position and what services are available for older adults at the CVS Minute Clinics. Anne? Thank you, Thank you very much, Um I, I am the Director of Clinical Quality at Minute Clinic, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Minute Clinic, we are the convenient care clinics associated with CVS Health, located in CVS and Target Pharmacies. And we have 1,100 uh, locations, practice locations across 33 states in the District of Columbia. And we also operate um, uh, virtual visits or telehealth visits as well um, with uh, over 3,000 advanced practice registered nurses on staff who facilitate our visits at the brick and mortar locations as well as online. In terms of caring for older patients, I thought I'd start with a story, actually. Um, I was told recently uh, from a daughter of a, an older adult who was a woman in an independent living facility that she was found walking around the halls of the facility and had a glass full of um, hand sanitizer. And they weren't sure if she had drunk any or whatever. She was acting confused. And the uh, staff of the facility contacted the daughter on a Saturday afternoon and said, we're having, you know, your mom's having some issues. And she wasn't sure what to do, whether it was an emergency or what have you, she was coming from far away. And she ended up taking her mom to the Minute Clinic where a nurse practitioner took great care of her, uh, recognized that there were some signs and symptoms of dementia um, and some concerning things going on. Um, recognized that it could be related to a UTI and tested her and she was in fact positive for a UTI. Um, the daughter wrote us a letter later saying she was so grateful for the care that the nurse practitioner had given her mom and that she had been compassionate and thoughtful about how she approached it. And this kind of thing happens every day at many clinics across the country as we care for the people across the lifespan from 18 months and older. And I know we do see quite a few older adults for a variety of services. Um, and I should say in 19, uh, or sorry, in 2018, Minute Clinic formed a very innovative um, academic practice partnership with Case Western Reserve University's Cusin Institute, the Quality and Safety Education for Nurses Institute with Dr. Mary Delansky. And together we set about uh, planning the uh, grant uh, application with the Johnny Hartford Foundation in collaboration with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement to launch age-friendly health systems at Minute Clinic. Now, age-friendly health systems is uh, a program that is about making care for older adults more age-friendly um, in every setting. So from acute hospital to ambulatory care, and uh, it involves using the 4M framework so that every older adult, uh, 65 and older, whether they're very healthy or whether they have multiple chronic conditions, can receive the same high quality care when we address the four ends, which include what matters most to the older adult in terms of their health care, um, what their medications are, and if they're on any high risk medications that might um, affect their well being, um, their mobility, how well they're staying active, and if they need assistance in that area, and also their mentation, which is uh, assessing risks for depression, dementia, and delirium. And so this 4M framework uh, really delivers a powerful way and a very easy way 
to encapsulate an approach to older adult care that is age-friendly. And I'm pleased to say that in 2020, we launched this in the midst of a pandemic when age-friendly care is more important than ever. Um, we launched this in May, and we've been training our 3,000 providers in the 4Ms framework so that when people come to Minute Clinic um, as an older adult, they, they will receive this 4Ms framework care, uh, an age-friendly approach to care, no matter what service they're coming for. And thank you so much for all you're doing and the leadership that you're providing. We appreciate that. Now, you're welcome. Now, Cheryl, you started your own business, Older and Wiser Life Services, in an effort to assist older adults and their families. Can you tell us more about it and what led you to become an entrepreneur? Thank you, Dean Musel, for inviting me to share my chosen nursing path here today. And I must add my thanks to Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing for helping to create in me a research-driven and uh, client-oriented career in private home care. From my early experiences at Ohio State University Hospital in Columbus as a clinical research nurse in the inpatient unit, my transition into home care and founding then a Medicare home health agency which I developed for five years, I kept seeking ways to better meet the long-term care needs I watched develop in that intimate setting of the client's own home. These issues became much more relevant and literally hit home as my own parents' needs escalated. The second opportunity to be an entrepreneur was placed squarely in front of me. My prior experiences in business and at Francis Payne Bolton promoted my courage to take this next step and act on my uh, purpose in nursing. The path to being an entrepreneur can be complicated, but once you recognize the need and find a way to provide that product efficiently, it becomes obvious. I would like to share a quote from an article written by Claire Ansbury in 2018. It was published in the Wall Street Journal Healthcare publication. In this one statement, you will find the evidence of the demand for the services that we provide. The quote is, as the country grows older, its caregivers are growing younger and more squeezed. Millennials now make up more than 24% of the nation's unpaid caregivers up from 22% in 2009. 6.2 million millennials provide care for a parent. Not only are these the peak years of family and career, they are peak earning years. In the same article, it was found that the average of 21 hours per week were devoted to caregiving tasks. And in total, 14% of millennials stopped working entirely. We are finding newer techniques being developed such as virtual care and telehealth uh, to be a great assist, especially this past year during our pandemic crisis. With our community focus relevant to our clients, our organization helps for the early planning of the aging in place in one's own home and the staff companions then to assist in accomplishing that goal. All of these staff companions are our employees. They are prepared with prior educational opportunities and have the opportunity to earn a uh, personal care companion certification at no cost to them. There is no blanket protocol that will provide and protect each of our individual clients. A, a targeted care plan is developed by our nurses to meet the specific needs of each diagnosis and infirmity to improve quality of life and enjoyment of life. The families we, we support have um, been very gracious in giving thanks to us. We are grateful to be able to serve them. I wanted to uh, give to you a basis for our development of our company. It was an NIH Agency on Aging um, preparation of five key points that can help one to age in place as safely as possible 
and they are, and, and I'll briefly summarize them here. Mm -hmm. Number one, appropriate dietary intake. Number two, staying mobile with adequate exercise. Number three, um, for health needs, see a clinician who knows you or an immediate assist that can get you, get the information back to your PCP. Take medications as prescribed. And number five, which is one of the key underpinnings of our service, see someone who knows you in person every 24 hours. This can catch anything going awry. And with our services in healthcare today, we can just about catch and prevent terrible um, complications. Our software allows companions in the home to note each visit and any urgent changes. Those urgent changes are sent to the nurse as an alert to change in client condition so that the nursing staff um, can proceed with a nursing intervention. Thank you so much. Cheryl, thank you for all you're doing to advance the health and well-being of caregivers and care recipients and, and also some of those formal caregivers as well. We, uh, that's very important. Uh, I have some more questions for you. Um, we know that COVID-19 has affected the senior population. How can all of us better protect this vulnerable population? And what advice do you have for our viewers? Uh, we'll start with Cheryl. Thank you. Um, one of the things I'll refer back to the NIH uh, five areas where we have found this, this proves true. If we can do those five things for a client in their home, uh, they will handle themselves uh, in a much better way being coming to us in a healthy state to start. Um, we found as a company that limiting, especially during this pandemic, of course, limiting visitors, wearing masks, of course, was helpful. We followed all CDC guidelines. The downside to this was the emotional reaction of the seniors that we were caring for. The isolation factors, the depression and anger that all resulted uh, was expressed regularly. We were working on ways to improve emotional communication and the way we place our caregivers uh, with attention to commonalities between the caregiver and the client has certainly helped to instill uh, a basis for trust. And that, that supports uh, the, the client during this time when they are isolated from family members who may be out working, taking care of children, having much more risk of exposing the client to the COVID virus. Um, we support all family members as almost as much as we support the seniors themselves. They need that type of support also. Um, this pandemic was not very helpful to um, our served population. And that's an understatement when we look at um, all of the statistics related to the virus. We are accepting, understanding, and smiling and uncomplaining to our clients so that we are presenting daily at, or as often as visited the, mm -hmm. um, the emotional support that they need during this time. We have not had one incident of COVID-19 in our clientele or in our staff. So we're very proud of all of our staff's efforts to enforce that. Thank you. Impressive, <laughs> impressive, thank you. Anne, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's been a year like none other uh, here in 2020 with COVID-19. And you know, from the very beginning, uh, Minute Clinic started an incident command approach to understanding how it would impact our clinics and our patients that we were caring for. And we began to implement uh, CDC <coughs> recommended changes such as uh, phone triage, um, steering people to telehealth. And we've also been able to support um, over 3 million people being tested for COVID through Minute Clinic and CVS Health. 
Um, we currently have a, a very um, honed process for uh, allowing testing in the community for people to go to the CVS drive through and it's a minute clinic ordered test, but they can actually be swabbed at the CVS drive through and receive their test results in two to three days. And we've seen that, that support a number of older adult uh, uh, patients as well as across the lifespan. You know, I think from ambulatory care to in the hospital to rehab units, we've seen COVID-19 have an adverse effect on so many parts of healthcare. And the CDC calls this out in particularly, in, in particular when they address the framework for seeing non-COVID-19 patients and how delayed the care has been for them. And I'm thinking of a patient who came to Minute Clinic, uh, an older woman who had signed up saying it was a wellness visit and she really wanted to quit smoking. And I, I think a lot of people have, have decided to quit smoking with the lung impact of COVID-19. But she came in and I think several of her symptoms were related to COVID-19. She had cough, she had shortness of breath. Um, and so the provider who was in full PPE went ahead and, and did an assessment thinking, oh, you know, could this be COVID-19 anyway? Um, it ended up she was really having trouble. She had delayed care for four months and um, she did have a pneumonia or other like symptoms, decreased breath sounds and so on and so forth. So we did um, get her to the emergency room and help her um, go forward. She turns out she tested negative for COVID-19, but she had developed a lung mass and metastasis to other parts of her body. And I think this delay in care is very serious right now. And so finding ways for people to get tested, uh, for people to feel safe about coming in for care, uh, creating safe places for uh, infect, you know, where there's infection control and prevention plans in place, um, and encouraging people to come in for care and not delay is, is really critical. I mean, at the same time, what Cheryl mentioned about the isolation is, is uh, also a very critical problem. And I think, you know, there are some states that are starting to allow family members to come into the hospital with their family members. I think that's the, a really good decision when you think about people being isolated in ICUs and, and uh, without family support. But I also know there are other states where that's not happening. And it really is important for nurses to be supportive and encourage those Zoom calls, uh, encourage those point, um, you know, points of connection with family members, however they can, uh, so that uh, family members aren't feeling as isolated. Um, we have a lot, we have a long way to go as a country. I mean, I think nurses have to be really resilient and creative and innovative uh, to continue to press into how we can care for patients during this time. Thank you. It's been great to see the response of nurses <clears throat> to the crisis. Mm -hmm. So, We have some questions now that were submitted by alumni when they registered for the webcast, and I'll start asking those now. Either of you, please feel free to respond. So the first question comes from Joanne Bart. What might be the level of risk for safe socializing for older adults? So, you know, I, I think it's very interesting. There was an article from the British Medical Journal about risk of socializing and risk relative to wearing a mask, how long you're in contact with someone and what you're doing. Are you sitting quietly? Are you speaking? Are you singing and shouting? And, you know, the different level of risk. So I think you have to think through you know, what, what kind of socializing are you talking about? And if it's a short period of time and you're all, everyone's wearing masks and you're speaking quietly and you're, you know, that sort of thing, there's less risk. I think maintaining social distancing is important um, to, a, to, to a certain extent, depending upon the risk and exposure. But uh, going to a, you know, a mass event where people are singing and shouting puts you at much greater risk. So I think, you know, staying in the quiet space, um, doing all the things the CDC recommends in terms of masks, uh, physical distancing, uh, hand hygiene, um, careful disinfection, all of that makes for a possibility of safe socializing. Um, and of course, Zoom calls are, are wonderful too. They are indeed. So. They are indeed. <laughs> all right, our next question comes from Kim Lenahan. How do you care for elders living alone or at a distance? Cheryl, I think this is something you might be able to provide some insight. Yes, and may I say I concurred with all of Anne's prior statements. Uh, I wanted to just give a little anecdote. I was um, at a funeral visitation situation, a lot of older people, 
And the ones that could keep their social distance adequately had a little coach with them, a, a family member or someone who knew them well, to keep them from entering in, in too close of a situation or um, possibly exposing themselves uh, to the virus by being in that crowded s situation. So sometimes we, uh, people at this age need reminders. So again, a companion, a family member, something like that does help when entering the social s situation. As far as the distance goes, I'm going to go back to the um, the adage uh, set forth by the NIH, someone who knows you sees you personally every 24 hours. So what we set up with our clients when we don't visit seven days a week is a schedule with the family and the neighborhood. There are neighbors who live next door who know you, who've seen you. And so if a family member or a companion from our company can't be there on a day, uh, we set up a, a, a tentative schedule with the neighbors to make sure that that is being accomplished. They report back to the family because, of course, uh, we're not involved on that day. But it is very effective. Neighbors are more than thrilled. Friends, um, other family, distant, more distant family members to to use this model to keep the client safer at home. And I would encourage you to do that when you're at a distance, especially. We end up with so much guilt, unnecessary guilt, and we need to decrease that amongst our family members that through no fault of their own have ended up at a distance. Good suggestions, thank you. Yes. All right, our next question is from Kim Preston. Are there any new protocols or screening tools that have been found to be helpful for a widespread assessment of mental health? And we're looking particularly at retirement communities. We have not done anything um, in depth along those lines. However, um, I, I believe it is necessary to check out that scope uh, another anecdote, a friend of mine uh, came to me and said, uh, my father has entered hospice care. He um, was 92, living in his own home, went into uh, an assisted living area, and the pandemic ensued, and he has not been ill, but he's, he has no desire to go on. So we need to have, um, and I'm open to suggestions, Ann, if you've seen something, um, or Dean, I'm sure you're seeing things. Uh, better mental health assessments of our aging individuals. Not everything is due to dementia. Uh, and we can tend to, as the example of the UTI, thank you, Anne, it's a hot button of ours, <laughs> checking for UTIs and our clientele. So um, I think it's an absolute needed area of increased focus. You know, I think the screening tools um, that are recommended for mental health, there, there are several. I think the easiest and uh, one of the easiest to implement is the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9. And the PHQ-2 has two questions about, you know, are you enjoying life? Are you enjoying your activities? And so on and so forth. Um, and if you get those two questions, however they're asked, um, if, if you score poorly there, then you go on and you ask the additional nine questions. I think from a retirement home community um, facility, it's really important to have a baseline of where people are and to check it regularly. I think as communities are isolated, but also maybe engaging in Zoom calls internally, you can keep an idea of who's participating and who's engaged. And um, the staff can kind of keep an eye on how much people are engaging outside of their apartments or so on and so or condos. And if they're really not, do that extra check um, and make sure you're checking in with people. Um, there are a number of tools, but the PHQ2, PHQ9 is a very effective one in terms of a screening tool for depression. 
And I think uh, these uh, the formalized tools are very effective at, at picking up depression and anxiety symptoms. But, um, but sometimes just simply asking somebody, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? How are you coping with, with whatever the situation is? Uh, really uh, will get you a lot of the information uh, and help you do a quick assessment as well. So, and that's something that would be easy for family and friends to do as well. Great. Uh, all right, another question comes from Margot Wyshynski. How close is the U.S. to herd immunity? That's an interesting question, and I, I can say, you know, we have done just over 100 million uh, PCR tests in the U.S., and about 8% are positive, and that's tests, not patients. So I know we're over 6 million patients who've um, been diagnosed with COVID, so some of those tests are more one person getting tested more than once. So 6 million patients out of 330 million citizens. I would say we are not close to herd immunity by any means. Now, some communities have more incidence and prevalence of uh, COVID-19 and others have a lower incidence. Um, so we're getting there, but I think the work that's going on right now for a vaccine is, is absolutely critical and we'll, we'll need that well before we get to a herd immunity level. Okay, let's now turn to some of the questions that have been submitted online as we've been having this, uh, this broadcast. Uh, the first question is, what lasting effects do you think COVID-19 will have on nursing home and assisted living facilities? We've, we've seen quite a few changes already. And um, I know that the, the nursing homes and facilities are struggling as we are for adequate staff. I think one of our biggest areas of concern now is recruitment. How many more nurses can we get out there? How many more companions, people who will provide virtual care um, in the, at the minute clinics? We need these resources desperately and we're, we're changing as we speak. Um, I know our nurses go out and, and do advocate visits to be present during a telehealth or virtual care visit while our client is on screen with a professional. And this is wonderful during the pandemic to protect our older clients, especially, of course, from uh, getting out there too much. So, um, uh, but the recruitment for staff, we find is the real uh, elephant in the room. We need appropriate numbers. I'm trying to convince some granddaughters <laughs> and grandson, <laughs> but I only have one grandson. <laughs> <laughs> More granddaughters. Yeah, I would have to agree that at Minute Clinic, we are hiring in record numbers for uh, not only our NPs, but um, people to support the testing workflow and follow up with results and conversations with patients, uh, LPNs and LVNs also to support care. Um, and in addition, um, you know, I think the other change is really this uh, shift to telehealth, and that is something that's happened across the board, similar to what Cheryl was saying. You know, skilling up uh, a nurse practitioner or others to participate in a telehealth or virtual visit takes some very unique training. Uh, you know, it's um, how do you do a physical assessment uh, appropriately if someone doesn't have any assisted uh, devices that can help with taking a blood pressure? Um, you know, maybe where I think we'll see a development of quite a few devices that help uh, facilitate taking the vital signs, people having a pulse ox at home, for example. But we, we absolutely still need that referral point to um, uh, brick and mortar or, you know, uh, actual hands-on care for the full assessment of some patients. But I think people are getting better at having a website mm -hmm. manner and uh, assessing patients virtually and doing what they can uh, to keep people in their home and, and safe uh, in this time. I think nurses are also changing uh, in the sense of um, getting used to wearing PPE all the time. And, you know, I'm trying to think through what it'll look like, what time frame it'll be that we'll be able to release and relax the, the sense of having to be in PPE, full PPE all the time. 
So that's an interesting dynamic, too. I also want to say, you know, we historically have had quite a few FNP students, uh, DNP students, precepting with us. And I think there have been some challenges in this time to think about how do we support uh, student precepting. Um, we usually tr precept around 1,000 students a year at Miniclinic. Um, you know, and we've had to cut back on that. Uh, first of all, because not having enough PPE supplies and also thinking through safety and all that. But at the same time, you think, um, you know, what's, what better time for a student to be involved and to see what's going on with care during a pandemic. So we're bringing that back slowly but surely. But I know that there have been some students impacted by uh, the pandemic with having to delay their rotations. Um, so getting back to care and figuring out how to support the students is a critical priority as well. Every day we can have students in clinical practice is a good day. It's a good day. Mm -hmm. um, I have another question that just came in that's related to this conversation. Uh, and it's, do you think COVID-19 will result in an increase in the utilization of home health, one-on-one -on -one health care options? Absolutely. We've been experiencing it since the pandemic has started. Uh, we were already seeing a, an uptick in requests, um, which I thought was due to the uh, demographic growth of our population, so um, of seniors. But uh, this has enhanced it tremendously. It's probably why I jumped to recruitment so quickly. <laughs> um, it, it is uh, an issue we face daily. We get people in transitional um, situations in employment. Maybe they've retired, maybe they've uh, decided to go a different direction or they're home with their family and want to work part-time. And it was the, uh, the issue that drew me to home care initially, besides enjoying that model of healthcare delivery, uh, it gave me time flexibility. I didn't have to go to a three to 11 shift. I could work nursing visits. I could do other um, scheduled work in, in my own timing. So um, home care delivers so much to the client in safety, in uh, enhancement of enjoyment of living by aging in place in their own home setting. And we're, happy to talk to anyone. And we do precept uh, students also, or intern, I'm sorry, we have paid internships for college students in nursing and healthcare mm -hmm. uh, related fields. And um, they're wonderful employees, delightful influence on our clients. And um, I can't speak highly enough about that influence on on a, on a person's well-being to see that bright, lovely young face come in smiling. So, um, and may I use your website? What was the phrase you used? Website manner? Website uh, manner, yep. I like that. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> phrase. Okay, now we need some, uh, some consultation and advice for this particular question that has come in. I am an adult who pr provides the majority of help from my parents who still live independently. What would you recommend as a backup plan if I get sick? Well, there are the minute clinics for uh, quick quick support to find out what the illness is. But um, we are seeing this also in our early planning in our communities that we service. We service five counties. And uh, in those communities, we're trying to implement early commitment to a home care provider that can pr provide companion care if emergencies arise. So we might just see that client once every two weeks for a two hour visit. We have to give our visiting employees a little bit. They won't go out for just a hello, how are you and, and, and look, but they'll work for two hours. So um, it's a scheduling necessity, that limitation. And um, um, we're, we're working on that whole concept of starting I think it's also, yeah go ahead. agreed 
I think it's also helpful to think of the resources that are available in the community for um, older adults. So senior community, senior centers uh, have some resources. Uh, there's also very many websites, AARP, uh, National Council on Aging, and other sites have resources for caregivers. And you can start to research and review and think about the options by looking through those references and identifying resources right in your community. I think there's a lot of innovation going on in this space. There are some apps that are being developed for caregivers and um, other things that can help you have a team of people who work and support your your elder, uh, your aging parents. So um, just doing a little bit of searching and researching and keeping track of what the resources are could be very helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, here's another question. Uh, the healthcare community has been stretched with the pandemic, especially for nurses. And what can CWRU alumni do to support their fellow nursing alumni? So I'll pass that over to you and um, then I'll give some of my ideas as well. I think that you will answer that the best. <laughs> um, but if, if uh, well, I, I just know in my own personal professional life, I meet a lot of healthcare providers and um, looking outside the box, just as Ann described, um, we need to change up what, we're, what we've done in the past and um, emotionally, I hope, in, in discussing that, we're giving support to the people that are out there stressed by this, this uh, pressure of not enough staff, not enough to meet the healthcare needs because of COVID-19. And um, um, I know that we're keeping nurses in nursing a lot longer. I am an example. <laughs> and uh, mm. I, I think that this is important too, that we realize uh, people do need support at different stages, childcare and then elder care. So um, I, I think just being aware does help and, uh, and different organizations, the Alumni Association, of course, can be very, very supportive. So thank you. Anne, do you have any thoughts? You know, I think this has been an in incredible year, as, as said before, and um, resilience is hard to come by. I mean, it, it takes a lot to stay agile and bounce back day after day after day, month after month in this time. So, you know, I think encouraging messages from alumni to students who are going into the field and, and um, getting ready to be in, in work in this challenging time might be helpful. Um, uh, letters, you know, that are in various publications of encouragement might be useful and how you have stayed resilient. You know, I think sharing your experience of how you've been able to weather challenges and storms and, and stay resilient would be really useful. So some additional ideas are, there are a plethora of volunteer opportunities. Um, we, we are in desperate need of contact tracing and I think um, alum, whether you're a nursing alum or other alum, uh, contact your local health department and just be on the lookout for, for volunteer opportunities. Um, if you're a nurse and you are in a position where you can help provide opportunities for nursing students so that they can get their clinical hours, it's very important that you um, you know assist in providing those that would be really um, that would be really super um, uh, some of the other things of course would be uh, supporting the Dean's COVID-19 fund uh, the COVID-19 fund actually is uh, a fund for students and for the resources that are needed. Uh, one of the things that we've discovered with the shortage of PPE, as well as some of the financial impacts on some of the smaller um, uh, health healthcare organizations where some of our students are practicing, uh, some of the students are being asked to bring their own PPE. And so we are uh, looking for ways to help support that. And so that COVID-19 alumni fund that, at the School of Nursing is one of the ways that we're able to do that. 
I think advocacy is so important. Oh, we know the importance of following uh, the PPE protocols, wearing a mask, safe social distancing, washing your hands, all of those things are just critical. And the more that we can do to advocate for that, both uh, in, our, in our homes, in our families, and in our communities, it's so important. And then the other thing is to get out and vote it will be so critical this particular election. Make your voices heard. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So uh, this may bring us to the end of our segment here. Uh, would you have any last words that either of you would like to say? I so appreciate that I've had this opportunity to uh, speak with you, Dean. And um, thank you, Anne. I so enjoyed meeting you also at this at this time. And I, we've used Minute Clinics before quite a bit. And now I'm going to use them more with our virtual visits. <laughs> Very good. It's a, it's a pleasure to link arms with you all and have this conversation about COVID-19 and the older adults in our lives and uh, how we can serve them as nurses and colleagues. So thank you for the time. I want to thank Cheryl and Ann for joining us today for this episode of Spartan Step Up. If you would like more information on this topic, please contact the Alumni Association. The contact information will be posted on the screen momentarily. Your comments will be forwarded on. And thank you for joining us today. Be safe, be well, and take care. <music>